Thank you very much for joining our program, Mr. Deval. Sure. Good to be with you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Deval, I'd like uh, to start from the point that recently the leader of the separatist regime in Karabakh, uh, Arai Kartunyan, uh, appealed uh, to the international community, calling them to help uh, to draw attention to the what's going in Karabakh and uh, in his uh, words to uh, to help uh, Karabakh uh, get out of the blockade. And on the other side, actually, Azerbaijani side is saying that uh, they are suggesting um, uh, humanitarian aid and everything from another route, which is Ardam Road. Mm -hmm. And uh, this uh, like dispute has been uh, quite uh, like some time. And you uh, being a, like a researcher, being an expert on the region, how do you see the way out? Sure. Well, thank you for the question. Um, yes, indeed. Obviously, first of all, I think we should start with the the fact that um, ordinary people in Karabakh, for sure, are suffering. There is, um, I'm told, very little food in the shops, um, almost no fresh food. Um, there is shortages of um, petrol and diesel. Um, there is a problem with getting um, baby products with medicines and so on. So I think I think this is this is obviously the the background to this. Um, and clearly, there's dispute been going on since last December about the Lachin Road, the Lachin Corridor. First of all, blocked by the um, Azerbaijani environmentalists, clearly with with government support, and then more recently, the establishment of the of the checkpoint, um, and then. So the this obviously all goes all the way back to December, um, and then I think only recently it was um, in July we had this idea of opening a route via Agdam as well, and then we but we continue to have international appeals which say basically that the Lachin Road needs to be open. So my I guess if you ask my position, it is that. Um, in order to ease the humanitarian situation um, in Karabakh, I think it's important that, that the Lachin Road is open to deliveries of goods from Armenia, that clearly there should be can be some kind of checks um, about to check that they're not taking anything illegal like weapons and so on. Um, the idea of, I think, of a road, the road open to, to Agdam is, I think, um, is a later option. It's it's for it's for later. That requires preparation, organisation. It requires contacts between um, the Karabakh Armenians and Baku. What do they want? How can it be delivered? How can it be organised? How can it be paid for? Um, none of that contact is there at the moment. So it's just an idea. It's not a reality. Um, so I think to ease the humanitarian situation, you open. The route to Lachin with checks, um, but then and you consider the Agdam route um, um, by discussion, by dialogue. This, you know, I think this is the general international opinion. If you look at the mm -hmm. statements from European Union, uh, United States, United Nations, and, and so on, I don't think there's any um, anything controversial uh, about this view. Azerbaijan has uh, an experience with international. Uh, community and Azerbaijan, uh, Azerbaijani officials usually state that they waited for all these negotiations for 30 years and nothing actually happened and that's why they had to uh, kind of use military uh, forces and uh, in this regard uh, like do you think like it's constructive from the separatist regime side uh, are they quite realistic uh, like, is it is it constructive from from their side not to take uh, humanitarian aid uh, goods from uh, Agdam Road? Well, I mean, we're talking about a conflict which is obviously, you know, thirty five years old. If we go back to nineteen eighty eight, um, and for most of that time, all um, contact, all routes with Azerbaijan have been blocked. There are two wars with Azerbaijan, so I think it's not realistic. Uh, to expect that the fear is lifted instantly. You need time for that. You need dialogue. Um, so I think from the um, point of view of the Karabakh Armenians, there's a lot of fear um, about what 
um, Azerbaijan is offering um, because of the two wars. Um, clearly, Azerbaijan, you know, also insists um, that this region is part of Azerbaijan. And I think the whole world now r recognizes the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan includes Karabakh. So the question then is, how does, on what terms does this um, happen, this integration of Karabakh into Azerbaijan? And I think the best way is obviously through some kind of dialogue. You need time, you need dialogue. And clearly, Azerbaijan also has security concerns that it doesn't want mm -hmm. um, weapons and soldiers to go from between Armenia and Karabakh. But I think that that issue can be solved um, by, so by some kind of checks at the border between Armenia uh, and and Lachin. So I think all of these problems can be solved. Um, but the trouble is you need time, you need trust, and you need dialogue. And we're not getting any of those things at the moment. This is, I think, why we have this crisis. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Deval, you are talking about, you mentioned the, uh, the security issue and the fear. Uh, however, uh, like, uh, doesn't it create more fear for the uh, for the civilians in Karabakh, uh, like challenging uh, Azerbaijan, uh, we the country which has like a much more big, like much bigger army uh, than than Karabakh itself, uh, isn't it a fear? Uh, in fact, yeah, I mean clearly the we know that the military, the now the big military superiority of Azerbaijan from the 2020 war. They control Shusha, they control Hadrut, they control Lachin. So clearly, uh, the Karabakh Armenians are in a very weak position. And clearly, you know, they are still, I think, still living a dream which 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 died in 2020 that they could be uh, separate from Azerbaijan. That dream, I think, died mm -hmm. in 2020. So the quest, but talking as an outsider, I think we will, you know we can try to avoid new conflicts. There are clearly several thousand um, men still in Karabakh, mostly belonging to what they call the self-defense army. Um, they still have weapons. They still would be prepared to fight. So I think the question is how to uh, settle this question, this dispute between the Karabakh and Baku peacefully so that it doesn't come to um, a new fight, um, some, so that you need some kind of demobilization of these armed men in, in Karabakh. Um, you know, this is a conflict like many we see all around the world, um, from, you know, Cyprus to Kashmir to Bosnia to Kosovo to Abkhazia. You know, we mm -hmm. see all of these conflicts. I think a solution is possible, um, but I think you need some kind of strong international uh, facilitation and you need... Um, and you need time to do this. I think a peaceful solution is still is possible here, mm -hmm. but clearly there's also a risk of, of a new conflict as well. Mm -hmm. You said the like the mil they militarized the region, uh, but however, Azerbaijan is claiming that actually the existing of Lachin corridor open uh, actually uh, leads to the uh, like militarization of the region. So in this case, do you think uh, leaving Lachin, because it has been open since uh, end of 2020 and until the uh, beginning of 2022, and uh, it was like open for about two years. And as Bajan says that when it is open, actually, uh, some weapons are brought to Karabakh. In this case, maybe do you think it's still the option to leave the Lachin corridor open? Well, I mean, first of all, obviously, the November... 2020 uh, trilateral agreement said that, that this was the responsibility of the Russian peacekeepers to be in control of the Lachin corridor, the Lachin road. Um, and then indeed, as you say, there were there were reports that the Russian peacekeepers were doing a bad job, that weapons were coming in. I haven't, I, I can't judge whether those reports were true or not. But now that um, Azerbaijan has a checkpoint in Lachin, um, it should be possible to screen, to check uh, trucks, lorries going through that road. You could ask international monitors from, I don't know, if you don't trust the Russians, from EU or OSCE or UN to have a presence there as well. So I think, the, the, again, these things uh, can be solved. Um, so that Azerbaijan says this is its Azerbaijan, 
territory and so on, and there's no weapons going through, but it's still possible for the people in in still living in Karabakh to get um, supplies from Armenia and to to visit their families and to go back and forth. It, this I think this is all possible, um, but um, you know you you need you just need to negotiate. And I, I mean I would add that on I think the paradox of this situation is that on uh, the other issues on the border, on the road to Nakhchivan, on the recognition agreement, I think um, it seems that the positions are quite close, the negotiations are quite good. It's always the Karabakh issue which is divides Armenia and Azerbaijan all these years. I think on other issues, um, they, they have learned to negotiate. They are negotiating quite well. Mm -hmm. you, uh, you said negotiations. However, these negotiations doesn't happen either. So how long the providence, the, the, the presence of Armenia can actually exist in the conflict, uh, providing food, etc.? Because these negotiations between Baku and Khan Kandy does not mm -hmm. actually happen. Uh, Baku says that they invited uh, them to Baku. They never came. And uh, so what, what, what? Well, they, mm -hmm. yeah, no, I mean, clearly these contacts need to happen. Um, you know, there are hundreds of, probably literally hundreds of issues that need to be solved mm -hmm. uh, between the Karabakh Armenians and Baku. You know, we can name them here about property, about um, the economy, about education, about the police force, about passports, etc., etc. The hundreds of issues that need to be solved. So clearly, those negotiations need to happen. I think there needs, um, I think there needs to be some kind of international expert uh, assistance for those negotiations because the issues are so complex. I don't think the expertise is there in Karabakh, and there is a lot of international. Um, you know, precedent about how these issues uh, were solved in the Balkans and so on. Um, but as we know, there was an attempt for a, of a meeting in Bulgaria, I think another one in Slovakia, mm -hmm. which didn't happen. Uh, we were told that the Russians, you know, didn't approve of these meetings. Uh, but then we, we also heard in the last meeting in Moscow, the foreign ministers, the Russians encouraging these meetings to happen. So for me, it's not the location, I guess, is, is not so important. The important is that these meetings happen mm -hmm. and that there's some kind of expert assistance to begin to tackle um, all the many, many issues uh, which need to be solved between the two sides. Mm -hmm. And how do you see the role of Baku in uh, these uh, negotiations? What, Baku, what else Baku can do in order to achieve negotiations happen? Well, I, I think... But, but hopefully Baku has been flexible. They, they agreed to a meeting in Bulgaria, I think, which didn't happen. And that wasn't the fault of Baku or of the Karabakh Armenians. It was the fault of Russia. So I think, you know, Baku clearly wants this dialogue to happen as well. Um, but I think what would be helpful, what I'm not seeing, maybe it's happening secretly. I'm not seeing the Baku expert community is kind of concrete proposals about how um, you know, how to deal with these many, many issues with Karabakh, which, as we know, was, has never been part of independent Azerbaijan. Let, let, let's be clear about that. About, um, Karabakh, the last time the Karabakh was part of Azerbaijan was in 1988. It was the Soviet time. So back in, Azerbaijan has built a state since then, and Karabakh has not been part of it. So if Karabakh is to be part of it and the people are to stay in their homes, which is, I guess, what we hope, then there are a lot, all these issues um, to resolve. Mm -hmm. uh, is it, uh, you mean, the, a road plan, that clear road plan that what is Baku suggesting? Uh, That's right, that? yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly, mm -hmm. road, yeah. Uh, isn't it the responsibility of the government to reveal it or the expert community should do it? Well, no, I think both. I mean, clearly the government hopefully is, 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 is working on it, but um, I'm just not seeing anything in the public space mm -hmm. about, um, about this, you know, um, I also spent many years working uh, in Georgia, and I've seen on Abkhazia, I've seen many long documents um, setting out the Georgian proposals for um, how Abkhazia could be integrated into Georgia, uh, with very, very, you know, many pages of, of documents there. Clearly, there's a Russian factor there which gets in the way. 
Mm -hmm. um, but I, I would hope that there would be similar documents being drawn up um, in Azerbaijan. Uh, Mr. Deval, I ask this question of the Azerbaijani officials or like uh, the, the experts that were close to the government and they said that in case Azerbaijan uh, reveals the details, uh, they are sure that the Armenian sides, Armenian leaders in Karabakh, they will kind of have uh, counter arguments and uh, they will challenge the documents. That's the argument the Azerbaijan side is bringing to the table. There are always, there are always arguments over these documents, uh, but mm -hmm. I think Azerbaijan needs to also to have this dialogue with itself because it's not, it's about what you're changing the future of, it's a different Azerbaijan, uh, which includes Karabakh, which includes all oh, these Armenians, um, you know, it, it's a new minority population. So Azerbaijan also needs to be discussing with itself, what, what, what you know, how does this change us? Um, Armenians were our enemies all these years, suddenly they're our citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of rights do we give them? Do we change our minority policy, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. It's 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 you know it's a conversation which is happened between um, Baku and Karabakh and inside Azerbaijan as well. I'd like to ask you about the role of Brussels uh, and role of Russia. Uh, like uh, for in the first place, like role of Russia. You said that uh, Russia was actually uh, like. Um, was a problem in negotiate that the negotiations didn't happen in Brussels, uh, sorry, in Bratislava. And uh, like, what is the role of Russia? Which side is Russia more uh, pushing pressure on? Like, is it Karabakh Armenians, Baku or Armenia? It's very difficult to say. This is for me is a mystery. Um, you know, what is Russia up to? Uh, Russia sent its peacekeeping force in 2020 to Karabakh. Um, again, at the time, we thought they wanted to stay there for a longer time. Um, but now, um, I guess for Russia, it's, you know, questions, issues number one, two, three, four or five is all Ukraine. Um, they're not thinking so much about the Caucasus. Um, they need their relationship both with Yerevan and with Baku. But it's a it's a bit of a mystery to me, to be honest, what uh, the Russians want from this. Uh, maybe they're not even thinking about it, to be honest. Um, we see that uh, Sergei Lavrov knows this issue very well, thinks about it. But but maybe it, it, it's not on the desk of Mr. Putin at the time. So it's a bit hard. So I'm afraid I don't have a clear answer. Mm -hmm. Because Baku is saying that, uh, like, uh Still, Ruben Vardanyan is kind of uh, interfering in the process and they are uh, trying because in the past, uh, Karabakh Armenians had actually some contacts with Baku, uh, with Sarsenk Reservoir, etc. And then uh, some in Baku believe that it's still Russia is pushing pressure on Karabakh Armenians and don't let uh, negotiations happen. Yeah, it, it's possible. I, d I, don't, I don't think Ruben Vardanyan is... You know, he's no longer an official in Karabakh. He's one of many voices. But I think the fact that there are different voices inside Karabakh makes this confusing. Um, you know, you've got um, Mr. Harutunyan, you've got Ruben Vardanyan, you've got Samvel Babayan, you've got all these different figures, all of whom had different ideas and different agendas. And that's not good for, obviously, for the ordinary people there. Um, they need um, some leadership. They need a clear voice um, and yeah no, it, it, it's it's not a good situation I agree mm -hmm. and uh, I talked to some experts from Azerbaijan today and uh, one of them told me that actually uh, the ruling elite in Karabakh is kind of uh, like using the population for their political purposes uh, do you agree with this like what do you think about this well, I, I, I think it's hard to generalize. I think some of them clearly want to serve the people. Um, and it's a small number of people there. It's not, I think we can agree, it's less than 120,000, less than 100,000, probably. Um, but, um, you know, it's clearly there are some rather dubious figures there. I would put Samvel Babayan in that category. I think he's had, you know, spent time in, in prison. Um, and there are some people... Um, like Mr. Vardanyan, who you know came from Russia, many questions about about 
him, but I, you know, I think there are people there who genuinely want to serve their people, but you know, they've lived in isolation for all these years. They had very little contact with the outside world. Um, they believed in this project of Artsakh, independence for Artsakh. So it, this is a dream which it's very hard for them to give up. Um, and so, you know, it, it's it's a it's a period in which they have to con consider their future in a completely different way, which is which is very difficult for them. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, people there, they have internet and uh, they can reach other resources as well. Or uh, do you think uh, like some international community should be let in uh, Karabakh and I don't know, some more discussions so that they are more in contact with reality or what do they need now? Well, I mean, again, I get back to the, I think this is a mistake on the part of Baku since 2020 is that they allowed Russians in there, but they didn't allow any internationals in there. You know, you could have had a short, small mission there from OSC or UN um, or EU um, to, and then, you know, to, to be there that they could have watched the Russians, they could have observed what was going on on the ground. You need a mission like that, I think, for the demilitarization uh, mechanism. Um, so yeah, I think I think uh, this for me is a mistake. Ba Baku says no international presence in Karabakh, but if you have no international presence in Karabakh, then you deepen the isolation of the people there. Whereas what you want is is for them to kind of have some international voices in their ear telling them about what is a realistic future for them. Baku is saying that uh, bringing international community right now to Karabakh would be like uh, legalization of uh, Armenia, uh, Russian, Russians there because they have to contact with Russians and the Russians need to allow them first. Well, you know, there was the November 2020 agreement which allows the Russians to be there. That was a, approved by the OSC at the Tirana summit. Um, so that statement has some kind of international status. Um, and, you know, when the whole world is recognizing the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan, I don't think it's a, a big problem for Azerbaijan to let internationals uh, have a presence in Karabakh, to be honest. Very shortly, I wonder why wouldn't Azerbaijan want international presence there? You know, I think, you, I mean, if you just look at this conflict, it's a, a conflict of maximalist positions. Um, and, you know, Azerbaijan is seeking to put maximum pressure always on Karabakh all these years. And the Karabakh Armenians also had their maximum uh, positions. And I think this mentality is still there, unfortunately. We're not seeing a kind of mental shift of people who want to, you know, genuinely work out a solution. I, I, I have to admit I'm quite pessimistic about this uh, about this situation. I, 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 I don't see um, a sign of an agreement between Karabakh Armenians and Baku. And if they don't have an agreement, um, then I think there's a risk of a new conflict. Um, so I, um, I don't see Baku being allowing this humanitarian crisis in, in in Karabakh to end soon. I'm, I'm so I'm, I'm a bit pessimistic, uh, to be honest. I think I think um, I would like to see a little more uh, flexibility um, in the name of solving this conflict, um, but I'm not seeing that at the moment, unfortunately.